حديثنا عن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين يبلغون رسالات الله ويخشونه ولا يخشون أحدا إلا الله وكفى بالله حسيبا So dear brother and sisters in Islam Now this topic today is about a great scholar of Yemen His name is Muhammad bin Ali al-Shawqani uh, He was born in 111, in 1173 of Hijra, 1250 is the date of his death. He lived for 77 years. But because we are more familiar with uh, uh, our calendar here, that is from 1760 to 1834. 1834. So it means uh, around 184 years ago. Uh, why we are speaking about Imam al-Shawqani, Imam al-Shawqani of Yemen. That is a very you know, important topic to see that how a country which was ruled by Zaidiya, Zaidiya are known as uh, one of the branches of Shia, for a thousand years For 1100 years, they have ruled there. So, how such a person like Shaukani, who was a great scholar, teaching Quran and Sunnah, and uh, was known with uh, his movements against Bid'a, how he came to be there in that country. So, first of all, As you know, Yemen is uh, in the south of uh, Arabian Peninsula. Islam entered there without any fighting at all. Sahaba is one Allah ta'ala alayhi ajma'in, like Mu'az ibn Jabal, like Musa, Abu Musa al-Ashari. They went there to propagate Islam. And uh, then among the tabi'in, uh, you got a very top name like uh, Ta'us, and then, uh, and then later Hammam and Mama and Abdul Razak, and even among the Imams like Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad, like uh, Abdullah bin Mubarak, Ibn Ma'in, Ishaq bin Rahway, Muhammad bin Yahya, all these people they have visited Jannah. Even the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has praised uh, the people of Yemen. They are very soft in their heart. Atakum ahlul Yemen, hum aliyanu kuluban wa araku afidatan. Very compassionate in their heart. Al iman wa yaman wa al hikma wa yamania. Iman, iman is is yaman, meaning praising Yemen, and hikma is from Yemen as well. And if you read Surah Sabab. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said about uh, the city of Saba, "Balda tun tayyiba wa Rabbun ghafur." Balda tun tayyiba, a very good town, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is very merciful upon them. So Yemen got a very important place in the Islamic history. Now, what happened? You know, let us uh, take some background. As you know that there is uh, after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam four khulafa, and then Bani Umayya started ruling. Among Bani Umayya is a caliph called Hisham, son of Abdul Malik, Hisham bin Abdul Malik. During that time, we hear about Zaid, Zaid bin Ali. Who is Ali? That 
Ali, which Ali? Zayd bin Ali, Zainul Abidin. He is the son of Al Hussein. Al Hussein, the son of Sayyidina Ali, Ali bin Abi Talib. So this uh, this person Zayd bin Ali Zainul Abidin. That was uh, the first one to whom Zadia is affiliated. He was born in in the year 80 of Hijra. Now I am going to, to mention Hijra calendar, which is easier to understand. If you, if you remember that now we are in 1440 years of Hijra, 1440 of Hijra. So he was born in 80, and during the time of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, he saw that the rule of Bani Umayyah is not uh, a just rule. So he was against that rule. And he said that we must revolt against that rule because it is not based upon justice. This is the main idea for which Zaidiya people or the followers of Zaidiya are known. That is Al Khuruj, revolting against the existing government. So he revolted, and of course he got many followers with him. As you remember that even one of our Imam, Imam Hanifa Rahmatullah Alayhi, he was born in 80 years, in year 80 as well, like that. So it means that they were contemporary. Imam Hanifa was supporting him, but actually he did not come with him, but he was supporting him. Unlike his own brother, the brother, Zayd's brother was Muhammad al-Baqir. He did not support him. And Muhammad al-Baqir, later his son Jafar al-Sadiq, they are among the line of another branch of Shia which is known as a Shia al-Imamiya. The Twelvers, they believe in twelve Imams. So that line is uh, very famous. Whenever we say about Shia, at once you will think about them. But this Zaid, Zaid ibn Ali, he revolted against Hisham bin Abdul Malik. And uh, because uh, they were not very uh, powerful at that time, they were defeated. Zaid ibn Abi was killed. He was taken by his supporters and was buried. But the other side of the people who fought them from Bani Umayyah, they were so much hostile against him that they took his body out of the grave. And then his head was cut and it was brought to, to the Caliph. But he himself was a very pious person, Zayd ibn Ali. He was known as Halif al-Qur'an. Halif al-Qur'an. Always with Qur'an, always reading Qur'an. Fasting, one day fasting, one day iftar. So in this way, this person who was known with his piety, with his knowledge, that this is how his life came to an end. After him, his son Yahya, he also continued with the same movement. And later, he was killed as well. And then two more Imams came in, in that line. That was during the Abbasid Caliph. And they were killed as well. So the main thing by which Imam Zaid is known is <coughs> revolting against an oppressive regime. That was the main idea which was always propagated by Zaidiya throughout their history. Those people who followed Zaid, they were later divided into main three factions. They say one is Salihiya, one is Sulaimaniya, one is Jarudiya. Nowadays only among, among all these factions only Jarudiya is, uh, is in uh, existence, or you can say they, are, they still survive, and their ideas are now taken by some people who are known as Al Husiyun, Al Husiyun in Yemen. Nowadays, if you are following the news, you can uh, you always uh, uh, you always hear about Al Husiyun. The present uh, Imam is Abdul Malik. Al Husi, and uh, he is the son of uh, Al Hussein before him, Badruddin Al Hussein. He was Al Husi Kadali. So during our times, these are the people 
who actually among al jarudiya a faction of zaidiya now saidna zaid was not able to establish a state no he was killed but later in 280 280 of hijra another person who was living in arabian peninsula a place called arras this man whose name is al hadi yahya bin husain al hadi yahya bin husain bin qasim he entered in yemen the first district in yemen is saada you must have heard about uh, sheikh muqbil bin hadi al muqbili sheikh uh, sheikh, uh, sheikh muqbil bin hadi al wadi you must have heard about him he was also in saada so this saada that is the main place from where zaidi rule started by whom al hadi yahya ibn al husain so he started his rule in 284 till 1382 around 1100 years 1100 years rule it was according to the georgian calendar it was 1962 1962 In 1962, that regime was uh, there was uh, a revolution against it, and then it turned into a democratic type of Yemen. So no more imamate of Zaidi uh, Imma. So the last one, the last of their uh, Imam was first Hamiduddin, who died in 1948, and then his son Badr, who was toppled in 1962. so these are the people who are known as zaidi and if we come to and we come to discuss about zaidi we must uh, understand one thing that among all the factions of shia the closest people to al sunna are zaidi the closest people imam natami also said it that they are the closest people to al sunna why do they say that sayyidna ali deserved the caliphate after the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but they don't uh, curse sayyidna abu bakr they don't curse sayyidna umar they don't curse sayyidna usman they say that the caliphate of a person who is less preferred is allowed imamat al mafdul and in the preferred person was sayyidna ali and he was not able to to be picked up as a khalifa does not matter because the main thing is that sayyidna abu bakr who was taken by or chosen by the people by the ummah then he was the right caliph so that is the best thing which is in zaidiya that they don't curse sahaba they don't curse uh, aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha and they don't curse uh, the, the three caliphs anyhow there are some differences in few things because uh, imam zaid was uh, impressed by al mu'tazila he is a contemporary of wasil ibn atha and wasil ibn atha who has started this uh, the movement of ihtizal so this is why it is said that he got some of uh, their views mu'tazila views among the mu'tazila views is that they don't believe that human beings could cite allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not even in al akhirah so they negate a ru'ya they negate seeing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is why this ayah of uh, surah al qiyamah wujuhun yawma idhan nadira ila rabbiha ila rabbiha nadira this means that uh, that day there would be faces very fresh and they were looking at the lord but they don't believe in looking at the lord so they say this nazara does not mean from nazara to look at but it is uh, like intazara they are waiting they are waiting for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is how they change or they got the ta'wil of that meaning in the very same way uh, 
they said that the person who committed the sin, major sins, the person who commits the major sins, there are three opinions about such a person. Extreme opinion is that of Khawarij. Khawarij, one of the Khariji, he killed Sayyidina Ali, Abdul Rahman and Muljim al So these people, they believe that the person who commits the major sin, he will not enter into Jannah. He will remain in the hellfire forever, forever, forever. This is their belief. Now these uh, Mu'tazila, they said, no, there is a place between the two places. Manzila bayn al-manzila tayn. Manzila bayn al-manzila tayn. So he is between hellfire and between al-jannah. He will remain in hellfire, in, remain in hellfire, but they say that still we don't say him as a kafir. He is not kafir, but will remain in the hellfire for, forever. Khawarij people they said that she is a kafir. The third opinion is that of Jumhur Ahlul Sunnah. Ahlul Sunnah say that the person who commits the major sin, if he repents, he becomes clean. And if he does not repent, he is under the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, with the shafa, with the intercession, with the intercession of uh, Anbiya, in, with the intercession in the end by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will come out of, of the hellfire. So these are the some opinion of al mutazila which were taken by Zaydiyya. And in the same way, giving ta'wil, yani taking a meaning of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, even among al sunnah there are Asha'ira who say that what does it mean? Yadullah, the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The correct meaning is that all the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We say yes, they are the attributes of Allah, the hand of Allah, the, the eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't give an interpretation to these things. We say, Laysa kamithli yishayun wa wassamiul basi. Nothing is similar unto him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala listens and he sees. So we don't make ta'weel. We don't make an interpretation of these names. But Ashaira people, they have given interpretation. They say Yad means Qudra, ability. Ayn means just to surveillance, to look after something. So in this way, there is some ta'weel of sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wajaa rabbuk wal malaku safan safa. Wajaa coming of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say, no, this coming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't. Uh, move from one place to another place. So it means Ja Amrullah or Ata Amrullah that his commandment came. Ata Amrullah. So in this way they have interpretation of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are as far as Aqaid are concerned. Aqaid. But in in practical in practical uh, or in their practice they have few things by which Shia are uh, Shia are distinguished. For example, when they pray, they don't uh, place their hand, right hand, hmm, on the left hand like this, on the chest. So, but they just uh, leave it loose. They don't fold it on the chest in the prayer. And this is the same way the Malikiya people they do, so there is not much uh, fuss about that thing. In the same way, they don't raise their hand when they go to, for, to Ruku and they come out of the Ruku. And they combine two prayers together, Zohar and Asr together and then Maghrib and Isha together. One thing which they have added in Azan, after Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, they have added what? Hayya ala khair al-amal. Hayya ala khair. They have added this uh, statement. So, these are the things which distinguish Shia. But otherwise, as I said to you, that Zaidiya people are the most, the closest one, the closest one to, to Ali Sunnah. And this is why they always read the books of Sunnah, Imam uh, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan, and they take evidence from, from the book of Sunnah. So if in this context, let us read about 
Imam al-Shawqani. Now, Imam al-Shawqani, who is known by his support of Sunnah, he has uh, written against Taqlid, blind following of Imams. He is the one who was uh, writing books after books about this issue. People used to, to, to make tombs on the graves and he's against the tombs, making the tombs upon the graves as well. Just like uh, the people in Arabian Peninsula. Later they are known to be the followers of Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. And let us understand that Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab is also a contemporary of Shawkani. But Shawkani survived him. Survived him for quite a long time. Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, he died in 1206. 1206. So it means Imam Shawkani died in 1250, 44 years after him. So anyhow, he has uh, a poetry, qasida, praising Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab after his death. And one thing is that among the long history of Yemen, Shawkani is not the first one among the people who was brought up among Zaydiyya. Yani he is treated as one of Zaydiyya because he learned the science of Zaydiyya, he learned the books of Zaydiyya. So among the Zaydiyya, he was such a great scholar to support the Sunnah. His famous book in fiqh is Nail al-Awtar. And Nail al-Awtar is an explanation of which book? Al-Muntaqa. And this Al-Muntaqa is written by whom? The grandfather Imam Nathabiyya, Majd ibn Nathabiyya. So Nail al-Awtar, which is uh, uh, one of the greatest book of Imam al-Shawkani, that is all in support of Sunnah. So what uh, we wanted to say that even before him, there were at least four great, great scholars in Yemen who were known with, with Sunnah. One is Muhammad bin Ibrahim al-Wazir. He got a very famous book called Al-Awasim al-Qawasim. Hussein Ahmad al-Jalal. Al-Hassan bin Mahdi al-Maqbali. And Muhammad bin Ismail al-Amir al-Sana'ani. Al-Amir al-Sana'ani. That person who has explained Bulugh al-Maram. And his book, Subul al-Salam, is taught in the University of Medina, in the Islamic University of Medina. So you can see that uh, in al Madina, the books of Imam al-Shawkani and books of Imam al-Sana'ani, his other uh, short book is Tathir al-Itiqad an Adran al-Ilhad. That is also told there, in, uh, is also taught there in al Madina. So Imam Shawkani was born in that district which I mentioned in the beginning, Sada in a place called Hajra Shawkan, a mountain, Hajra Shawkan. And then his father, because he was a Qadi in Sana'a, he, he was brought up in Sana'a. At least he read upon 17 shiukh, great 17 shiukh. Among them is his own father, Ali bin Muhammad bin Abdullah. And another sheikh called Abdul Qadir bin Ahmad al kawkabani that person taught him uh, the books, uh, the six books of, uh, of Hadith, Bukhari, Muslim, and Sunan al arba And then there was Al-Hasan bin Ismail, Al-Hasan bin Ismail al-Maghrib. You can say that this is the person, Al-Hasan bin Ismail, that uh, who guided him to read Al-Muntaqa and give an explanation of that book, uh, write an explanation of that book. So we, we can also say that he is the person who moved him towards a salaf So he became uh, one of the Imams of Salaf. Imam Shawkani is also impressed by Ibn Hazm, by Imam Ibn Taymiyyah. He never went to any other place for, for learning outside Yemen. Why? Only because his parents did not allow him. They said, no, Yemen is a place of knowledge. Just read here. Don't go anywhere else. But another thing is also which we should know in the history that he did not go even for Hajj. Any, I, might be some other reason, but he did not go for Hajj. When he was just 20 years old, you can see that how intelligent he was. 
just 20 years old, he has finished his studies and started teaching. And he used to have 13 lessons, 13 lessons in a day, teaching the children. He started uh, writing fatwa at that age of, of 20. But without taking any wages, any money upon al fatwa. When he was 36 years old, at that time, the ruler of Yemen, that is among the lions of Zaidiyah, that ruler is known as Al-Mansur Ali ibn al-Mahdi. Al-Mansur Ali ibn al-Mahdi, during his time when their Qadi, Qadi al-Qudat, yani the chief judge, whose name was Yahya ibn Salih al-Sahuli, he died in 1209, yani three years after the death of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. When he died, there was a place for Qadi al-Qudat. He asked Shawkani to accept this post of Qadi al-Qudat. For one week, he was just thinking, should I take this post or not? Even people came from each and every quarter of Yemen telling him, please take this post. By this you are going to support Sunnah and you are going to uh, demolish Al-Bid'ah. So Ash-Shawkani later, he made up his mind that I should accept this post and became Qadi. And he remained Qadi during the time of three rulers until his death, 1250. Three rulers. First one, uh, as you know that he was Al-Mansur, then his son Al-Mutawakkil, then his son Al-Mahdi. All, for all uh, that long period, he was a, a Qadi. Muhammad bin Ali al he was known with his opinions. Let me mention some of his opinions. First of all, he is dead against taqlid, blind following of, of Imam. He said, follow Kitab and Sunnah. And then, some people, they have said that uh, the gate of Ishtihad is closed after the fourth century. No, the gate of Ishtihad is not closed. It is still open. He said that the person who got enough knowledge and then he does not do ishtihad, he is committing shirk, he is committing kufr. Till that extent, he said. And he said, because the books of sunnah are known to us nowadays, so ishtihad is more, is easier for us in our times. Shaukani, that Shaukani is saying 184 years ago that ishtihad is now very easy for us because the books of sunnah are prevalent, are known everywhere, are found everywhere. And we must understand that during the time of Ash-Shawkani, there was no press in Yemen. Books were not printed at all. They were just copied. Though in Europe, in, from the 16th century, people have known the press and books started uh, coming into publication. Not in Yemen. So if he was saying that thing, 184 years ago, what about now, when you can say that uh, all the books of Sunnah, mashallah, they have come to, uh, come to us and uh, they are pub uh, publicized and we got access easily to all the books of the Sunnah. And I have mentioned that he was also against making tombs upon the graves. So he has written about that as well. Some of his fiqhi opinions, he says that a person who is drunk, if he divorces his wife, that divorce does not happen. You see now how the jurists see to that issue. Some jurists who say that the divorce of a drunkard person is valid, they say because he committed a sin, you must punish him. So if he divorces his wife, then this divorce is valid. This is what he said. This is what they say. But he said to them, Subhanallah, he is getting the sin of uh, being drunkard. He will get the sin. And you want to punish him once more? You know, there is a punishment for, from Allah for him. Why you want to punish him once again? 
If a person is drunkard, he is not in his senses. If he divorces, then this divorce is not acceptable. And that is the right view. In the same way, he has accepted the opinion of Imam Shafi'i and that is the right opinion, where to stand on a janaza. So if it is a janaza of a man, then the Imam should uh, stand facing his head. And if it is the janaza of a woman, then he should stand in the middle, and just uh, in the middle of the body. That is uh, the stand which is taken by Imam Shaukani as well. And uh, he, because he was appointed as Qadi, and uh, before his time, in, uh, in the court, people would come, all of them, and they sit in front of the Qadi. But he said, no, that is not the right attitude. Person should come one after the other, one after the other. So the Qadi could listen to the two persons who are against each other, who are complaining against each other, they could be in front of the Qadi without the involvement of any other person, any third person. So you can say that one. this is one of the reforms which he brought in uh, the Yemeni courts. And later I am going to discuss about, that is that will be in the end, end of my speech, his <coughs> opinions about the expulsion of the Jews and the Hindus from Yemen. Because this is one of the subjects which was not dealt with by many people. Many people who have written the biography of Imam Shaukani, they will not mention it. Uh, but uh, it is mentioned by very, very few persons. So I am going to, to mention it in the end. Few things are taken against him, that Imam Shaukani believed few things to which we don't agree. Yes, not all the people are perfect. So he got uh, some of defective opinion as well, uh, as we could say. W what are these opinions? I have mentioned the interpretation of some of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the people of Mu'tazila. But it is not very clear from his book. In some places he would say, when we discuss the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these two ayat are the major ayat. In the light of these two ayat, we can understand this issue. And the other ayah, So in the light of these two ayat, he explains the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in some places we see that he has taken ta'weel, or he has given the ta'weel of some of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the issue of tawassul. Issue of tawassul, and when you make dua, can you mention the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam or his dignity, his jah, his dignity as a wasila? Atawassalu ilayka bi jahin nabi. That phrase, that I, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I come to you with the wasila of the status of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It is said that Imam al-Shawkani, he confirmed this, or he approved uh, this type of saying. And even if a person goes to a grave, a grave of a pious person, a wali for example, and then he does dua there, he says that as long as visiting the grave is allowed, then this dua is allowed as well. He was asked, what about if he points towards the grave? He said, no, 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 pointing towards the grave is not allowed. And what he said, he said that you can visit the grave of a wali, of a pious person, and you can make their dua if you want to make a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same way, he said about uh, uh, the movement of Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, and later, later, the uh, the rule which was uh, which emerged between uh, because of an alliance between Muhammad ibn Saud al Amir and Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. So, as you know, this uh, this rule which was later known as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia because it was an alliance between the political 
the political leadership of Muhammad bin Saud and the spiritual leadership of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. So he said that taking a spiritual leadership and enforce it upon the people as a hukum, as a rule, is not allowed. He was uh, against uh, that idea. This is another thing which has been mentioned about him. Now let us take a few more points from his life. As I said to, said to you that he served three rulers of Yemen, Al-Mansur, then Al-Mutawakkil, then Al-Mahdi. In their absence, he used to take the oath of allegiance, Al-Ba'a, from the people. In their absence, he used to write letters to different rulers of, uh, of uh, the surrounding countries. So it means that he got a very high positions uh, in Yemen. And it is also said that uh, when the forces from the Arabian Peninsula and during the time of uh, uh, the rule of Muhammad bin Saud, they have attacked different places including Sana'a. Their forces came to Sana'a as well. And at that time, Al-Mansur consulted ulama. He consulted Imam Shaukani as well. What should we do? How to, how to face those people who are attacking us? Imam Shaukani said a very interesting thing. He said, Imam, if you want really a victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then all those taxes which you have levied upon the people, withdraw them. Don't take from them any, any taxes. In Arabic it is known as al-mukus, the taxes which got no justification at, at all. In Arabic it is also known as al-jibayat. Al-jibayat. He said, finish all these jibayat, finish all these taxes, and then you will have victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was some other ulama, Zaidi ulama, and they said to al-Mansur, no, the government's main source of income is these taxes. If you don't take these taxes, you will have no income. So, he went against the opinion of Imam al-Shawqani. Anyhow, Imam al-Mansur, he was very impressed by Imam al-Shawqani. He took the advice of Imam al-Shawqani and the other person who was against him because he started uh, propagating against Mr. shawqani that other person was expelled to one of the islands in the Red Sea. There was a very disturbing event which happened during the lifetime of Imam al-Shawqani. You can say that was a test for him. As I told you that uh, in Yemen mainly there was Zaidiya, the father of Zaid. And they were very, they are very much close to Al Sunnah, but still they have their innovations, they have their bidah. Among Al Sunnah Shafi'iyah, they were uh, present in Yemen, especially in Tihama, which is the coastal strip of uh, the Red Sea of Yemen, in Yemen. And then in the highland, in the, uh, uh, sorry, in the, in, the south of, in the south of Yemen, like Adan. In the north were mainly Zaidiya people, Sada and the surrounding areas, and Sana'a as well. So Imam al shawkani in the year 1216, 1216 of Hijra, the month is the month of Ramadan, and he was teaching Sahih al-Bukhari in the main mosque of Sana'a. And people flock to him, to listen to him. Now there was one of the ministers who was very much against him and he got this extreme ideas of Shia. He did not like Imam al shawkani giving this lesson in Sahih, of Sahih al-Bukhari in Jami Sana'a. So he encouraged another Zaidi Imam and very interestingly this Zaidi Imam 
whose name is Yahya bin Muhammad al Husi. He is one of the teachers of Imam al Shaukani. But because he was a Zaidi and uh, he was instigated by this minister, he asked him to do a lesson in a book called Tafrid al Quru or Tafrid al Karm. This book explains the merits of Sayyidina Ali. All right, merits of Sayyidina Ali, doesn't have, uh, nothing wrong. So he used to do it in Masjid Salahuddin, not in Jami Sana, not in the big grand mosque of Sana. But because of this uh, minister, he moved his lesson to Jami Sana. And he started giving this lesson there. All right, talk about the merits of Sayyidina Ali. No, this person now started cursing Sahaba, the companions, al Khulafa al Rashidi. And when he started doing it, more and more people come and join his lesson. It was a great fitna. There is this great traditionalist, Muhaddis, Imam al-Shawqani. And there, there is this person who is cursing Sahaba in the same mosque. So, the matter was raised to the ruler al-Mansur and he stopped the person from doing the lesson in the mosque. So he did not come to the mosque, but his followers came to the mosque and then they, when they did not find him, they asked the Muazzin, where is our Imam, where is our Halaqa, where is our circle? They said, no, he has been stopped. So they started shouting in the mosque, they started uh, clapping in the mosque and there was uh, a, a great fitna inside the mosque. If it was inside the mosque, it might be tolerable. But they went outside the mosque to the houses of some other ministers who were supporting al sunnah Starting stoning the houses. Even there were women and children in the houses and they were all frightened. And they were to the, they went to the house of uh, Imam al-Shawqani as well and throwing the stones on these houses. And you can see that if uh, the stone hits a child or any other person in the house, it can kill. So this is what happened on that single day, that night. Then. There were people who were sent by the ruler, Imam al-Mansur, and the fitna was stopped. And the next day, these people, they were taken group after a group, group after a group, and then they were punished. Yani they were uh, given some type of flogging by the sticks. This also shows that uh, Imam al-Shawqani got such a great respect in the court of uh, al-Imam that Imam supported him and he did not support the other Zaidiya who were creating fitna in the town. So we can say that this was one of uh, the most troublesome moments in the life of Imam Shaukan. Now let me mention some of his books. In total, about 278 books were compiled by, by Imam al 278 books. I have already mentioned Manual of Akbar, which is the explanation of al Muntaka Muntaka Al-Akhbar by Majd ibn Zaymi. And then his tafsir book, Fathul Qadir. It is known, this book is known because it refutes al Israeliyat, all narrations which are coming from uh, Bani Israel sources. And he also refutes Imam Zamakhshari, who is uh, one of uh, Mu'tazila. Then he got uh, his history book, Al-Badru Talih. Al-Badru Talih, this book uh, gives the biographies of all the great Imams from the seventh century of Hijrah till his own times. And it covers around uh, 500 years. Because Imam al Zahabi, in his book Seer Alam al Nubala, has covered till his own time. 
which is the the seventh century. So from seventh century till thirteenth century, Imam Shaukani has covered all that long time, giving the biographies of all the great scholars and imams. Then his book Irshad al Fuhul, that is a great work in Usul al Fiqh, the principle of Fiqh. His book Al Fawaid al Majmua, which speaks about the fabricated ahadis. Before him, Ibn al Jauzi and uh, Siuti and uh, Ibn Iraq, they have written about the fabricated ahadis. Imam al Shaukani also added. Uh, that that issue with this book then all his fatawa are collected in a book called al fath al rabban that is the book of fatwa in two great volumes another book at durr al bahiya another book in uh, al fiqh al sayd al jarrar al mutadaffiq ala hadayat al azhar the book about uh, negating taqlid al qawl al mufid في أدلة الاجتهاد والتقليد، the book which uh, speaks about those people who curse the Sahaba, negating or refuting their claims، and this book is known as إرشاد الغبي إلى مذهب أهل البيت في سحب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. Let us speak about his uh, his pupils, his students. Some people they said he got uh, only around 13 students. Another said 32 students. But somebody has listed 92 names of his students. Among them, his own son Ahmad, who became Qadi as well. Among them is Ahmad, the son of the second ruler Al Mutawakkil during his time. A great scholar of India, Abdul Haq, Al Hindi, Abdul Haq. He did Hajj in 1216, uh, and then he came to take ijaza from Imam Shaukani. He came, sorry, in 1238. Imam Shaukani died 27 Jumad al Akhirah. Now we are in the month of Jumad al Akhirah as well. Huh? 27th Jumad al Akhirah, 1250 of Al Hijra. His janaza was held in uh, the Grand Mosque, the Grand Mosque of Sanaa, and he was buried in the cemetery of Al Khuzaima in Sanaa as well. To commemorate him, in Sanaa there is a big hall called Qa'a al Shaukan. There is a road which is also known as Shar Muhammad bin Ali al Shaukan. In 1990, a seminar was held in Paris, in 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 France, in Paris, France, just to discuss the great works of Imam al Shaukan. So in, it shows that the people have given him a great respect by holding this seminar in a country like Paris, in a country like France. that was his life now i said that i'm going to mention in the end his opinions about the expulsion of the jews and the hindus from al yaman now this story starts from not from his time in 1088 one of the zaidi rulers who is known as al imam mahdi in his court this matter was raised what we, what should we do about uh, the jews living in yemen because yemen is the part of arabian peninsula and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said before his death akhrijul yahuda wal nasara min jazirat al ahad expel the jews and the christians from the arabian peninsula so that was the wasiya of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so the matter was discussed now there were two opinions one opinion was of zaidia zaidia 
because they were ruled by the family of Al Hadi, so this is why they are known as Al Hadaviyah as well. Hadaviyah. So this branch of Zaidiya is called Al Hadaviyah because of Imam Al Hadi. He got books, and this is why he is uh, he was a scholar. Al Hadaviyah said that there are two ahadis. One hadith of Abu Ubaida. Which says that uh, expel the Jews and the Christians from Al Hijaz, and they say that even Sayyid Abu Bakr and Sayyid Omar, in the time of Sayyid Omar, when he expelled uh, the remaining Jews in Al Khaybar, so he expelled them actually from Al Hijaz. In the beginning, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time, there were three tribes of Jews. And they were expelled because of their betrayal of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So that was one opinion, and the that only from Al Hijaz they should be expelled. And Hijaz is Makkah and Medina. This is Al Hijaz. And the other opinion is no, the whole Arabian Peninsula, which cover till south of uh, Yemen, till the end of Yemen, they should be expelled from. The Arabian Peninsula. So this Imam, who is Imam Mahdi, he agreed with the opinion of uh, Shafi'i ulama, and he said yes, they should be expelled. There were Hindus also living there, and they were known as Baniya. Till now, uh, this this word Baniya is known. That Hindu people they are known as Baniya. So they said uh, in English they also write Baniya as well. So they were taken from Sanaa to the port of Aden and Mukha. They are very close to each other under the sea. The idea was that they should be expelled to India because uh, India is a, a very large country. And it is populated by Hindus as well, so they would accept them easily. But because of some difficulties or because of some other circumstances, they were never expelled. They remained there, and later they came back to Sanaa after one year. Why they have come back? There are many opinions. Some people they say that uh, because. They have bribed Al Imam. They have bribed the ruler to remain in Yemen. This is why they were not expelled. Some others say no, because of the economy of Yemen. It depended upon the Jews and upon the Hindus. This is why they were not expelled. Later, there was another family from Iraq, Jewish family, and uh, among them, one of their rabbi. You know the rabbi is a name for their priest among the Jews. He came to the governor of Sanaa during the time of uh, Muhammad bin Al Mutawakkil Ismail. That is 1097. 1097. He came to the governor of Sanaa. This person, this rabbi, is known as Suleiman Jamal, and he said to the governor of Sanaa, "Man." Your rule has come to an end because one thousand years have passed upon their history. So that your rule has come to an end. Now this is our time to rule. A man is challenging, challenging the government in this way. So anyhow, he was captured. He was arrested and was taken to Al Amir. And of course, uh, it was uh, just like a rebellion, a revolt against the existing regime. This is why this person has to be executed later. And Imam was very concerned because of that issue, and he wanted to expel them. And as I said to you, they were not expelled, but they came back to Sanaa. It is said that as far as the Hindus are Baniya, they were only 125 near 1007. 1,763. Imam Shaukani. Now we come to Imam Shaukani because during the time of Imam Shaukani, there were still those people living in Sanaa. So this is why one of his short booklet is 
حل الاشکال فی التقاط اليہود الازبال حل الاشکال فی التقاط اليہود الازبال so they say that these people they should only do one thing uh, they should be given one job to clean the toilets uh, and to pick all the waste of the animals from the streets this is what it means uh, so we can say that imam shaukani he got his uh, participation in that issue as well and he also wrote uh, another booklet which is uh, entitled حكم السبيان الذين مات آباؤهم. What about those children, those uh, those young children whose fathers died and they became orphans? So these orphans should be should be accepted into Islam, should be raised as Muslims. That was uh, his ruling or uh, his fatwa. Though other people they said because. Their parents are uh, are Jews. They should be treated as Jews, or they should be raised like Jews. But Imam Shaukani said that as long as they are orphans, they should be given the benefit of Islam. They should be given uh, the beauty of Islam, and they should be raised as as Muslims. Most of the Jews in 1940 they have migrated to Palestine to become the part. Of uh, Israel later, so this is how uh, the Jews during the during our times, most of them they have already migrated to Israel. In the end, let me mention that these Zaydi rulers, they were always among them, always supporters of Sunnah. Actually, they supported Imam Shaukani against their own Imams. So it could be said uh, very wisely that among all the Shia, the practice of Zaidia was the most wise one. They are the closest one to to Al Sunnah. That is their position throughout the ages. But what happened? Because of some political tension nowadays, even our times, because of this political uh, ambitions. That person who is uh, now known as Al Hussein ibn Badruddin Al Husi, this person fled away from Yemen. He went to Tehran, and uh, though he did not confirm or he did not approve the the beliefs of Shia at all, he does not believe in cursing Sahaba. He does not believe in cursing Al Khulafa Al Rashidin. He does not believe in taqiyya. He does not believe that our imams are infallible, masum, like the 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 belief of Imamia. He does not believe that. But still, when he went there in Tehran, he stayed there for many years. He came back with all those beliefs of Imamia, and this is how, after his death, his son Abdul Malik, who became now. The the leader of Al Husiya or Al Husiyun. Now we can see that there is a friction between Al Sunnah and Al Husiya, between Zaidiya and Al Husiya as well. Even Zaidi ulama they don't approve uh, the beliefs of Al Husiyun, but it is only a political conflict which is going on. So we must understand that the conflict here is not. Of Zaidiya or Al Sunnah, this conflict is a political conflict. Zaidi people they have been ruling this country for quite a long time. Even their last prime minister Ali bin Abdullah Saleh, he was a Zaidi as well. And uh, the main thing is that Abdul Malik Al Husiya they they want to revive uh, that rule of uh, Zaidiya, but In a very extreme form, which they have inherited from Imamia, from Tahran, and this is what is disturbed. This is what is disturbed. But that is going to change the prevalent conditions in Yemen. And in Yemen, as I said to you, for for the last thousand years, 
Ahlu Sunnah, Shafi'iya and Zaidiyya, they were living side by side. Even there were marriages among them. And uh, there were not many major conflicts. There were some, but not very major conflicts. Not like uh, what, what was happening in Baghdad throughout the history of Abbasi period when there were riots between Ahlu Sunnah and between the Shia. No, nothing like this in Yemen. So now with these new elements which have come from Tehran, uh, we fear that the, the relations between uh, the followers of Zaidiya, the followers of, uh, of Ahlu Sunnah, it is going to suffer now. And this should be avoided. This should be avoided. And still there are people among the scholars of Zaidiya. I have listened to many of their scholars. And uh, uh, I'm thankful to Brother Ali, hmm? Ali Hassan, who gave me this opportunity. Uh, I did not think about the subject. I have been reading Shaukani, I've been reading Nadul Avtar, but uh, I, was, I, I never read in so depth as I have read it to prepare for this lecture. So I, you know, I have read quite a lot and listened quite a lot as well. So I can say that now there are ulama, there are scholars, Zaidi scholars, who wants to maintain those good relations which used to exist between Al Sunnah and uh, Zaidiya throughout the ages. They don't want this conflict at all. So this is why they don't approve what Al Husayun people are doing nowadays. <coughs> So these are the few things which uh, I wanted to say this evening. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi al-ma'in. Wa sallallahu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.